Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the grace and the love that you have shown us in Christ. As we consider your word now, help us to know how we are to live in response to your grace and empower us by your Spirit to live this kind of life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, when you get married, everything changes. Before you walk into the church, you're single, and close physical intimacy with your girlfriend or boyfriend is inappropriate. You shouldn't uh, stay overnight in their house. You shouldn't call uh, their parents papa or mama. But when you walk out of the church, married, everything is different. You've got a new role. And everything needs to change. So you should start wearing a, a wedding ring on your finger. And you should call your in-laws, Papa and Mama. And you should live under the same roof with your spouse and be physically intimate with each other. Because before you were single, now you are married. And friends, in our passage today, we see that it's the same with the Christian life. Before we trust in Christ, we walk in one way. But when we become a Christian, everything changes. We're a new person. There is an old self to put off. There is a new self to put on. There are behaviours that must cease. And there are commands that must be followed. But it's really important before we look at that new life that we understand the context for these commands. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul is not just giving you know, the top 10 tips for being a good Christian or outlining some moral standard we need to reach in order to please God. Rather, Christians live in response to what God has already done for them in Christ. And in chapters 1 to 3 of Ephesians, Paul has already articulated in detail what God has done for us. He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing. And he's saved us by his grace. And he's brought us near. He's reconciled us to him and also to one another through the cross. And in the light of that new identity, we live a new life. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, these words. He says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. And in chapter 4, verse 22, he tells us we are to put off the old self. And in chapter 4, verse 24, we are to put on the new self. Uh, so Ephesians chapter 4 outlines for us the kind of life we are to live. And it not only tells us what we are to do, but why. Because Paul knows it's only the gospel that motivates right behaviour in us. We will only live the way we God wants as we remember what he's already done for us in Christ. Well, the first thing we are to do in this new life is to tell the truth. Verse 25. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbour, for we are members one of another. See the structure? First, what you shouldn't do. Second, what you should do. And third, why? So we shouldn't lie. Uh, in the non-Christian world, lies abound. Uh, people hide the truth or they, or they bend the truth however it is convenient to them. We live in the world of fake news, where you deliberately spread things that are false, or you call things that are true lies because you don't like them. But Paul reminds us, if we are Christians, we can't live like that anymore. We must speak the truth to one another. See, God loves truth. God always speaks the truth, and he wants us to do the same. Uh, not just to tell one another what we want to hear. Uh, not just to hide our true motives or feelings to keep someone happy. We are to speak the truth in love. And Paul tells us why. 
because we are family. We are members one of another. We are united in Christ. And it is the truth of the gospel that created that unity. And so we do not destroy it with lies. Second, he speaks about anger in verse 26. He says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Now, Paul reminds us here that not all anger is wrong. Sometimes anger can be justified. We should be angry at injustice, for example. God gets angry with our sins. But God is also slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Uh, the problem with our human anger is that it is rarely pure. And it very quickly leads to sin. We start saying things we regret or doing things that are unloving. And so we must deal with our anger quickly. Verse 26 says, Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Or say, sort it out. Or let it go. But don't let it grow. Verse 31, we read these words, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamour and slander be put away from along with all malice. And notice how anger, even when it is right, has no place in the Christian life. We are to deal with our anger when our parents are overbearing or the internet connection is too slow or our friend speaks a harsh word, or someone lies to us, or someone gossips about us. We need to deal with our anger quickly. Because if we don't, we'll give the devil an opportunity to destroy the unity that the gospel has created and stir us up against one another. Well, thirdly, Paul speaks of work. Uh, he says there in verse 28, Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him, do, let him labor, doing honest work with his hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. So stealing is another aspect of our old life that we need to get rid of. Now stealing is about getting something for myself without having to pay for it. Or, or getting something through, through dishonest means. Now, I think very few of us would uh, walk into a store and put something in our backpack and then walk out without paying. But many of us would steal in more subtle ways. We might steal by uh, purchasing pirated DVDs or computer software. Or we might steal by plagiarizing someone else's work. Or by photocopying our textbook. Or, or the like. But that's not the Christian life. The non-Christian wants to pay less. The non-Christian wants to, to steal. But the Christian who's experienced the grace of God wants to give. And we should be, we should be honest. We should work hard. We should earn money. And we should pay what is due and be generous to those in need. Fourthly, Paul speaks of our speech in verse 29. He says, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. So the non Christian uses their speech to tear others down. Uh, they gossip, they complain. They say unkind words, they swear, uh, they tell dirty jokes. But for the Christian, all those things are the life of the past. We should remove ourselves from such conversation, and instead we should speak what builds up. We should speak words of grace that benefit the hearer. Before I speak, I should think. I should think, will this benefit my brother or sister? Is it true? Is it loving? Is it helpful? 
And if the answer is no to any of those questions, don't say it. Well, finally, we consider the area of relationships. And when we're at verse 30, Paul writes, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. See, the Holy Spirit is leading us into holiness. The Holy Spirit is uniting us in love for one another. And so we're not to, to grieve the Holy Spirit by doing any of those things of verse 31. We're not to be bitter, you know, being upset about something and, and, and refusing to let it go. We're not to have wrath and you know, angry outbursts and rage. Not to have anger, losing our temper. Or slander, speaking bad about someone else through gossip and lies. We're not to have malice. We're not to deliberately hurt someone else. Instead, Paul says in verse 32, what we are to be like. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. See, friends, God forgave us our debt to him when it was so big that we couldn't ever repay him. And God didn't wait until we'd repented before he did something about our sin. See, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He took that first step, that costly step, to send his son to die for us. And we too must be willing to take the first steps to heal relationships. Now, even when we've been wronged by others, the first step may be to decide not to keep nursing a grudge against someone. Now, it might be to forgive someone, even though it really hurts. Of course, the Bible never says it will be easy. Now, it doesn't mean that we will give the person a chance to sin against us again and again. And it doesn't mean we'll just forget the whole thing ever happened. But it does mean we won't take revenge on that person. And we won't spread our bitterness to others. We will forgive. Forgiveness may be very hard. But we need to remember that God is not asking us to do anything he hasn't already done himself. God forgave us. We ought to forgive one another. Well, when you get married, you can't live the single life anymore. Your, your life has got to change. And the same is true when we become Christians. We can't live that old life anymore. We need to live out our new identity in response to all God has done for us, in our speech, in our work, in our relationships, in telling the truth, in being ready to forgive, we are to live out that new identity that we have in Christ. Now, dear friends, many times this is going to be so hard to do. Our, our sin clings so closely to our hearts. Many times we will know the right thing to do. We know we should forgive. We know we should be kind to others. But we just don't want to do it. We don't want to let go. And friends, only the gospel will help us to tell the truth when it's hard. Only the gospel will help us to deal with our anger. Only the gospel will help us to forgive those who have hurt us. And when we fail, it is the gospel that will bring us forgiveness with God. So we must always remember this gospel. Jesus died for our sins. He was raised to bring us new life. He loved us so much. And as his people, he wants us to love one another even when it's hard, 
in response to his love for us. You have a new life in Christ. Will you live it out? Will you live out the gospel? Well, let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for giving us a new life. Thank you that in your love you took the first step, that you sent your Son Jesus to die for us on the cross. Thank you for such great love. And we pray that in response to your love for us, that you would help us to love one another in our speech, in our work, in our relationships, in our truth-telling, in our forgiveness, that you would help us uh, to be the people that you want us to be. Help us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen.